there tonight in Chicago, a moment we've never seen in American history. The first woman of color nominated by a major party in the spotlight on this final night of the Democratic National Convention. And our special coverage starts right now. A historic test for Vice President Kamala Harris. Together, we will chart a new way forward. The Democratic nominee speaking directly to the American people in her first major address since taking over the ticket. Democrats fired up for the final night of a week-long celebration. Turn out for what? America, hope is making a comeback. Kamala Harris! When we fight, can she reach undecided voters and keep the momentum going on this critical night on the road to the White House? From NBC News, live from Chicago, the Democratic National Convention. Here are Lester Holt and Savannah Guthrie. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our special coverage, the fourth and final night of the Democratic National Convention. We're live here in Chicago, and tonight before an audience of thousands in this arena, which is at capacity, by the way, and of course the millions watching at home, Vice President Kamala Harris will make history with the biggest speech of her life. Harris shattering another barrier, the first black woman and Asian-American person to accept a major party's nomination for president. Her address tonight is perhaps her best opportunity to define herself and reintroduce herself now as the new Democratic presidential candidate just weeks after she took over the top of the ticket from President Biden. The vice president's speech is set to focus on three areas, sharing her background, drawing a contrast with her opponent, former President Trump, along with what her campaign is framing as her patriotic vision. Well, the DNC theme for the night is for our future. As the country enters the final stretch of the presidential campaign, Election Day just seven 75 days away and a raucous crowd out here on the convention And it's floor. probably going to get noisier at points as we move along. We've got a lot to get to tonight. Coming up, we're going to hear from a slew of big names, including remarks from Arizona Senator Mark Kelly, a performance by the singer Pink, a speech from Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer, and, of course, tonight's keynote address from the star of this convention, Vice President Harris. Well, Harris will be speaking tonight, by the way, on her 10th wedding anniversary. We heard from the second gentleman, Doug Emhoff, a little bit earlier this week. And as we gear up for the grand finale, we just got to go there. There have been a lot of rumors, Lester, in this arena all week long, actually, that Beyonce might perform tonight. Got to say, NBC News has not yet confirmed that. The convention has had a lot of surprises up its sleeve. For what it's worth, the security guard that checked us in in the car earlier says that Beyonce is on the premises. Take it for what it's worth. And, and that's the only one we're mentioning. There have been others mentioned uh, big surprises. Yeah. The crowd is certainly feeling that end. Right now, we're about to hear the Chicks, formerly known as the Dixie Chicks, perform the national anthem. Let's go to the stage now and listen. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleam whose broad stripes and bright stars that 
just some of the star power that we have seen through this convention, and uh, we expect, as Savannah mentioned, even more before the evening is out. We want to bring in uh, Meet the Press moderator Kristen Welker now and our senior Washington correspondent Hallie Jackson. Kristen, let me start with you. This is a, a, obviously a very raucous, a very important uh, event here, but in terms of what it means going forward, how does it launch the campaign forward? What are the blanks that Vice President Harris will likely have to fill in tonight? Well, the big question is, will the momentum she had coming into this convention turn into a post-convention bounce? And a lot of that could be determined by what we hear from Vice President Kamala Harris tonight. The big questions I have, will she clearly lay out for the American people how she will govern? Will she govern differently than President Biden? How will her agenda be different? What will her tone be? Of course, we've talked a lot here at this table about the fact that Democrats seem to be trying to shift to a more positive positive tone, feeling like President Biden's tactics of trying to paint former President Donald Trump as a threat to the democracy may not be resonating with voters, Lester. Well, we are looking at right now the convention floor and Kerry Washington, who is the tonight's celebrity host. There's been one every single night. We've already touched on the Beyonce rumors. We're about to hear from some of uh, the relatives of Kamala Harris, but I'll briefly bring you in, Hallie, as we wait for them. Um, so we're expecting Kamala Harris to kind of fill out. This, we've said it a lot. I think it was a pollster's quote. said she's famous but not known. And so tonight she's trying to be known as a presidential candidate. And the word I've heard a lot again and again is the word reset for Kamala Harris right now. Given that she is the vice president of the United States, people know her name, of course, but this is her appearance now as the presidential nominee of the party. And so defining her in this moment is going to be critical. That's why the kids, the family, the, the humanizing piece of it for her, like we saw when her husband took the stage, is going to be important here. You look at the numbers, too. She's had a 13-point favorability jump just since June. It's a new polling just out today, Savannah. Democrat are hoping that momentum keeps moving forward. But for people who don't know what she stands for, how important is it for her to not just flesh out the biography, mm -hmm. but put some meat on the bones in terms of policy and what she would want to do? She's going to have to, but it's also a delicate balance here, because remember, this is a huge audience here. To get into the wonky weeds is not something that we anticipate, but she will have to lay out her vision for the future, her vision for America. I've talked with a couple of people close to her today, and they say that she is ready for that, that she is resolute, but she is also joyous. And that's another word that we heard again and again this convention is the word joy. I would also point out people are waving American flags here. This idea of reclaiming patriotism is important. Well, the crowd just went wild here. As Tony Goldwyn, the former Scandal co-star, makes apparently a surprise appearance with Kerry Washington. Let's look. Okay, video, guys. We're going to take it together. We're going to post it to social media, text your friends, Okay, let's record. We're recording. You ready, Tony? Yep, I'm ready. Okay, ready? When we fight, we fight. When we fight, we fight. When we fight, we fight. Are you ready for Kamala Harris to win? Good, because when Kamala wins, America wins. Okay. No, you gotta go. Bye, everybody. Tony Goldwyn, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Okay. So it's come to my attention that there are. So, Kerry Washington, this is actually a strategic moment because the Democrats have been trying to create these yeah, viral moments. Right. Now, Lester, I know you watch every season of Scandal, <laughs> and you immediately recognize the chemistry between Kerry and Tony because of their characters. Sure. And as Kerry would say, it's handled. But they're trying to <laughs> as, as they're trying to create these viral memes and moments, and some of that has happened organically. Well, we saw that the, the minute she became obviously the, 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 the nominee, we saw that in all corners. Yeah. And, and this is something that I mean, they they credentialed content creators, influencers. So so they're not fooling with us old media folks. They're going for that young vote, and it's turning up in the polls. Well, the young vote is so critical, and it's particularly critical because former president President Biden was trailing with young voters. She's grown, but not enough. Well, speaking of young, these aren't voters, but we are seeing members of Harris's family coming up, so let's listen in here. Put it together, and it 
It's one, two, three, Kamala. All right, so let's practice, let's practice. Everybody on the, everybody over here say Kama. Everybody over here say La. Together. So those are Kamala Harris's grandnieces, and they're making a virtue of that Kamala Harris's name has been mispronounced. <laughs> Including by her say, political opponent, of By course. her political opponent yeah. consistently, yeah. and some people think that's confusion, and some people see something more sinister. Yeah, yeah, perhaps like a microaggression, essentially, from former President Trump against Vice President Harris, given the historic nature of her candidacy, which brings us to a couple of things. The historic nature of her candidacy has not been something that she has leaned into heavily on the campaign trail, and those around her say that that's pretty intentional. They believe that her role, her presence, speaks for itself as if she wins, the first, of course, black woman president, the first South Asian president. Uh, and I will say, Ella Emhoff, you talk about young voters, she is somebody who tends to go viral online. Hi, I'm Mina. I'm Ella. And I'm Lena. I grew up in Oakland, California, in a house full of extraordinary women. My mom, my grandma, and my auntie, who showed me the meaning of service. Helping her sister, a 17-year-old single mom, fighting for justice for the American people, and still cooking Sunday family dinner. She guided me, now she's guiding my own children, and I know she'll guide our country forward. Kamala came into my life when I was 14. Famously a very easy time for a teenager. <laughs> like a lot of young people, I didn't always understand what I was feeling. But no matter what, Kamala was there for me. She was patient, caring, and always took me seriously. She's never stopped listening to me, and she's not going to stop listening to all of us. Kamala Harris is my godmother. To me, her advice means everything. Whether it's pursuing my passions, making an impact, or finding hope when the world doesn't feel so hopeful. She taught me that making a difference means giving your whole heart and taking action. She's fighting for economic opportunity, LGBTQ plus equality, and reproductive freedom because we are not going back. She's fighting for social justice, health justice, environmental justice, and she isn't alone. We're all in this fight together. So let's keep up the fight. Let's keep up the joy. And let's elect this extraordinary woman as our next president. One of those key moments reminding viewers that there are families like that look like this all across this country mm -hmm. and celebrating the blended nature of this family. And part of this, again, is getting to know who Kamala Harris is. That's right. This is a reintroduction of Vice President Kamala Harris and these very personal ties and very personal pieces of her past are going to be so critical to that. Let's go down to the floor, check in with our senior national correspondent, Tom Yamas, who's in the thick of it all. Hi, Tom. Hey, Savannah, great to be with you tonight. There's a lot of entertainment right now, so everyone is sitting at the moment because we're watching the man on stage here, D.L. Hughley, the comedian and actor who's just taken the podium. Likely to be a lot of laughs over the next five or ten minutes or so. Um, you may notice a lot of American flags over the crowd here. Old Glory is the star of the night so far. A lot of patriotism on display here at the United Center in Chicago. The energy level throughout this night, the last night of the convention, has been about a ten. When you talk to delegates here, they tell you they are excited and looking forward to not only hearing Vice President Kamala Harris, but seeing her up close. We're right here by the stage. We expect the space to go wild when she comes out. Just over my shoulder here, Governor Walls has been up in his suite, 
and the first gentleman as well. But again, they're sitting down right now watching the entertainment. I will tell you, Savannah, because you referenced this earlier, I've been asking delegates if they heard the rumor about who may not perform or show up, and everyone is saying they're hearing that same rumor. Again, we don't know if it's true or not, but people are talking about it. Beyonce may or may not be here. Um, I was speaking to this delegate right here. She's the one who actually talked to me about the rumor. First of all, what, what have you heard? Well, I mean, we've heard, be ready for all the surprises here at the DNC. Night four, it's always exciting. So, uh, Beehive should be ready, should be watching. Yeah, whether she's here or not, I'm sure this place is going to explode with excitement on whoever that surprise guest is. Talk to me about the white. We've noticed so many women tonight in white throughout the convention hall. Why is that? Women's suffragette movement. Of course, women getting the right to vote. And with our votes, we're going to put the first woman in the White House to represent all of us. All right, we thank you so much. Remind me of your name. Victoria Martinez Muela. All right, thank from California. So Victoria, thank you so much. All right, the laughs have started here. Savannah D.L. Hughley has the stage right now. I'm going to send it back up to you guys. All right, Tom, thank you. Tom, our chief White House correspondent, Peter Alexander, is on the convention floor. My first question is, can you move down there? I understand they <laughs> shut down access to the floor a little while ago. Yeah, it's a tight squeeze down here, I'll tell you that much, and, and our feet are all going to need a massage at the end of these last several days because people have been standing in the aisles. This has literally been a standing room only experience. We're talking about the energy in this room, joy, optimism, and patriotism. patriotism. Those are the words that Kamala Harris is going to be striking over the course, that mission, that message over the course of her speech tonight. These folks have been just lighting things up, dancing, enjoying, among them Dana, my new friend from Atlanta here. You are a delegate. You went to one of these conventions in 2016 in Philadelphia. How does this one compare, Dana? It, it's phenomenal. I mean, I can't even say how much. This is like a freedom party. We are celebrating democracy. We're celebrating freedom. We're celebrating truth. And it's you can feel the energy in the room. And, and give me a, so if you can, give me a sense, though. You've been here over the course of this night. Mm -hmm. Highlights, obviously, night one, we got to see Joe Biden. Night two, we saw the Obamas. Last night, Coach Walls had this place ready for the pep talk, like a post-game locker room, you know, party celebration as people were leaving. Leaving. Tonight, you got to hear from Kamala Harris herself. How you've heard? Have you heard from her? And what is about her story that's inspired you? Um, I think just her her ferocity. I feel like she's going to fight for us. Um, the joy that she brings. You've got some folks out there trying to make fun of her laugh. It makes no sense whatsoever. We should have more laughter, more joy, and I think that that's what she's going to bring to the table. Dana, we've had fun hanging out with you. If you don't mind, we're going to hang out together a little bit, mostly because I can't get anywhere else. But this position, <laughs> we're tightly squeezed in here. So that and last back to you guys. All right. Peter, thanks. Joining us now is Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro. He spoke at this convention last night, was previously vetted as a possible uh, running mate for VP Harris. Uh, welcome, first of all. Thank you. It's great to be with you. Talk about the evening, what we expect ahead, and what you mostly expect from Kamala Harris. Well, first off, if, if you can't tell, folks are fired up. They're excited here. And Kamala Harris gets to come and greet these delegates that are sending her on to the White House. And they are people who I think are excited to hear about her life story, hear about her vision, hear about the kind of things she wants to do to lift up this nation. I'm excited to hear her remarks tonight. If there's any do or die state for both campaigns, it's Pennsylvania. I think so, Democrats and Republicans agree on that. Yeah, that's the one thing you all agree right. on, which it means that all these candidates are going to be parked in your state. But how do you assess it right now, and particularly having Kamala Harris at the top of the ticket versus Joe Biden, who is a sort of honorary yeah. Pennsylvanian, having been born in Scranton? Yeah. But how do you, what's the lay of the land for you? You know these politics very well. Well, we love Joe Biden, and, and we love our, our native son. I think what's clear, though, is the race has really changed since he got out. I mean, it's effectively a tie right now, a tie right now. Um, the candidates are, you know, plus one, minus one, something like that. Pennsylvania is a wonderful state. It's an incredibly challenging state to win in. Kamala Harris, think about it this way, has kind of marched 49 yards up the field. That last yard and a half is tough in our Commonwealth. The good news is... I think she's poised to pick that up. And she understands you got to show up in communities that oftentimes feel ignored and left behind. The day, I think it was a day or two before this convention, she was in Pennsylvania, not in Philly or Pittsburgh, and we love Philly or, and Pittsburgh. She was in rural Beaver County, talking about economic issues, talking about cutting costs, really important stuff. That shows that they get it. You got to compete everywhere in our common. A convention is not a measure necessarily of progress in a campaign. How do you capture this energy, but also with the reality that this is going to be tough. Well, what I've done, what great people like Bob Casey
Stacy have done. I think Bob's going to win his election. Our senior center is doing a great job and always putting people before the powerful, unlike his opponent, who does the opposite. I think what you got to do is show up, and you got to put people first, and you got to let them know that you understand their concerns and lay out your plans on how you're going to lift them up. Kamala Harris has begun to do that. I think she'll continue to do that over these coming 76 days. Governor, you spoke last night. You had the crowd going. It drew the notice of uh, former President Donald Trump, who yeah. tweeted or put on social media and called you the highly overrated Jewish governor of Pennsylvania, who refuses to acknowledge no. that he is the best friend to Israel and the Jewish people. I'll just let you respond. Yeah. I think the head shake you're doing sort of says it all. Look, um, this is a serious thing. I mean, this is more anti-Semitic tropes from a guy who wants to lead our nation. More injecting of hatred and bigotry and creating others in our society. I, I want to be clear about this, guys. Like, it doesn't upset me. I, I don't get too high from the good or low from the attacks. But it does upset me that it upsets other people out there. Because when the guy who wants to lead our nation attacks someone who's different than him, peddles this type of bigotry, it makes people feel less safe. That's what I hear from others. You know, Lori and I are blessed with four kids. We try and raise them to be good people. We try and raise them to respect others. You would at least want those values, those traits, in the would-be leader of the free world. Donald Trump doesn't have those traits. I think Kamala Harris does. And at the end of the day, after all the policies, after all the articulation of vision, I think it really comes down to what kind of person do we want leading us. I want someone who's caring and empathetic, not someone who's divisive and chaotic. Can I ask you, though, I mean, this issue of Israel, the, the war in Gaza, has clearly divided the Democratic Party. There is a large, uncommitted movement. It's, it, it's quite substantial in a state like Michigan, which is an Another must win, probably, for the Democrats. How concerned are you about that? Look, I think what's happening in the Middle East is it's really tragic. It's tragic what happened on October 7th when a terrorist group led a raid into Israel, killing over 1,200 people, capturing over 200 hostages, including Americans, bringing them over and then suffering abuse and sexual violence in Gaza. I, I, I mourn and I ache for what happened in Israel. I also mourn and ache for what's happening in Gaza. The quickest way for us to end this is for the hostages to be returned home and the violence end and get back to a meaningful dialogue about creating peace in the Middle East. I want to be really clear, though. All of what I just said, there's some nuance to that. I get that. But there should be absolutely no nuance when it comes to standing up against hatred and bigotry in all forms, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, whatever hatred that is, we have to condemn that. And when people like Donald Trump inject that into this dialogue, it makes it harder to find peace. It makes it harder to bring the hostages home. It makes it harder to end the violence in Gaza. But to the politics question, hearing everything you just said, are you concerned at all that that, could, that, that division could erode the Democrat support in some of those key states? I, I think at the end of the day, folks are going to go to the polls and understand that they've got two really stark choices. We can go with chaos and extremism, or we can go with someone who is trying to bring about a peaceful end to this, who is trying to bring the hostages home, who is trying to stop the violence that we're seeing in Gaza. And that is the person, ultimately, in Kamala Harris that I think people will talk to. Right. Gov Gov Governor Shapiro, thank you so much for coming and speaking with us. We do appreciate it. We'll let you get back into the convention. Thank Unless you know if Beyonce's coming. Uh, you know there's I, a rumor. Is there? Yeah. You haven't heard uh, this? I'm not on the inside. Okay. On that one. <laughs> but man, oh man, would I love to see Beyonce. <laughs> <laughs> You're a fan. We'll there you go. Down. Big time. Governor Shapiro, thank you so Thanks, much. Man. Well, we're continuing to watch what's happening on the convention floor here. They're doing a video interstitial, and we'll expect uh, in a few moments a section on the, in the convention floor, Lester, about gun violence and about people who have been impacted by that personally, including, of course, former Congressman Gabby Giffords of Tucson, Arizona, who herself was a victim of violence. This will be much, much in, in line with what we saw earlier this week with uh, reproductive rights and people telling their stories. Lucy McBath. When I worked for Every Town for Gun Safety and Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America, 
I saw firsthand the power of telling our stories. You've just heard mine, but there are many more to tell. On December 14, 2012, I walked into Sandy Hook School. I stopped at the office, chatted with my principal, then started my day with my second graders. Suddenly, a loud crash, like metal folding chairs falling. 154 gunshots blaring. Hiding in the coats, trying to sing with my students, trying to read to them, trying to drown out the sounds. Terror, crying, running. I carry that horrific day with me. 20 beautiful first grade children and six of my beautiful colleagues were killed. They should still be here. It's 10.30 a.m. at Robb Elementary in Uvalde. The school is recognizing my 10-year-old daughter, Lexi, for receiving all A's. She receives a Good Citizen Award, and we pose for photos. She wears a St. Mary's sweatshirt and a smile that lights up the room. 30 minutes later, a gunman murders her, 18 classmates and two teachers. We are taken to a private room where police tell us she isn't coming home. Uvalde is national news. Parents everywhere reach for their children. I reach out for the daughter I will never hold again. My niece, Sandy Patrice, was 22. She drove to Myrtle Beach for sun and fun and motorcycle parades. Hours later, my phone rang, shooting on the beach. No one can find Sandy. I stayed calm. You see, my mother, Patricia Ann, had been shot and killed by an abusive partner I was calm then, too. I got to handling business. I called relatives, the police, hospitals, and I kept calling, voice steady, heartbeat pulsing. Then I was connected to the coroner. Ten years of waiting, and Sandy's murder is still unsolved. I'll keep calling and I'll keep fighting. I was in high school when my classmate got shot. It changed my story. Instead of about worrying about taking a test, I started worrying about living to take another test. They say schools are for learning, and I did learn a lot that day. I learned how to run, how to hide and drop, that what happens in the news can happen to me. But I learned something else too, that we can write and must write a new story if we choose to. Our stories of loss, 
But make no mistake, our losses do not weaken us. They strengthen our resolve. We will secure safer futures that we all deserve. We will organize. We will advocate. testimony and drawing images in some days that we would hope to never to think about again. When you look at the issue of gun violence here in this party, it is critical for Democrats. Seven in ten say it is a huge problem, and it's getting a contest. And uh, Gabby Gifford taking the stage. She's escorted by her husband, Senator Mark Kelly, and her son. We'll hear from us in a moment. But Gifford is one of the most famous gun violence survivors after she survived a mass shooting at one of her campaign events back in 2011. That shooting left her partly paralyzed and impacted her speech. But since then, she's built a massive gun violence prevention group and brought the issue to the forefront, and she's here to talk again before this convention. born in the great state of Arizona. I was born with grit. I grew up racing motorcycles, mucking stalls, and exploring the beautiful desert. I fell for an astronaut. For five years, I served in Congress from a swing district. Everybody called me a rising star. Then on January 8th, 2011, a man tried to assassinate me. He shot 19 people. He killed six. Terrible, terrible day. I almost died. But I fought for my life, and I survived. to talk again one word at a time. So many people helped me as I worked hard to recover, including a decent man for Delaware who always checked in. in. He still does. <laughs> Thank you, Joe Biden. Thank you for everything. Joe is a great president. My friend Kamala will be a great president. She is tough. She has grit. <laughs> Kamala can beat the gun lobby. She can fight gun trafficking. <laughs> Kamala stood up to Wall Street and the drug company. She will protect abortion access. She will defend our freedom. She saved lives. Join me in voting for Kamala Harris! Bravo! Thank you! Gabby Giffords, who survived an assassination attempt, a gunshot wounds, feared dead, survived. 
as she just said, led an incredibly courageous path back to do what she just did. I can guarantee, knowing her as I do, we're from the same hometown, she worked very hard for that moment. It's she an really, incredible survivor story. It really is, and this is one of the issues that is the starkest divide between Democrats and Republicans. They have a very different vision about how to address this issue, and from Sandy Hook to Uvalde, we just heard uh, victims' family members. There's now a generation of young people who believe that the issue of gun violence is paramount, that elected officials need to do something about it. And this goes back to our discussion about the importance of young voters. This is one of those issues that resonates so deeply with them. Well, the, the, the class of Newtown survivors are graduating high school now and turning 18 if they're lucky enough to live that day, and they're turning into voters, and so it has become a very prominent issue with younger voters. Uh, as we wait this speeches to continue. Let's go down to Peter Alexander on the convention floor. Hi, Peter. Tonight, I was struck by how many people were wiping away tears and really been feeling the last several speeches we heard about gun violence in this country. I just met Melinda, a school teacher, and a mom. I could see you just moved by the words of Gabby Giffords and the others. What did their stories mean to you? Uh, I'm a mother of two children, a 10-year-old and a 7-year-old, and I just want them to be safe at school. In addition, I'm also a school teacher, and I want every single student that I teach to be safe every day and to know that they can focus on getting an education in school and be safe. Well, and I appreciate your talking to us tonight. Her story is, you not, is not unique, Savannah and Lester. Over the course of these last several days, we've, had, we've met so many people who are here for a variety of different issues. Abortion access, their fears about gun violence, in this country, Stability. their desire to have safe schools and safe communities. Melinda's is just one of thousands similar we've heard over the course of these last few days. All right, Peter. And then there is the commander in chief test, and that's going to be an issue going into this campaign. Senator Mark Kelly taking the stage. You saw him there with his wife, former Congresswoman Gabby Giffords. Kelly's a former astronaut. He represents the swing state of Arizona. He's flown combat, he's flown in the space shuttle, and vetted uh, by the Harris campaign as a possible VP running mate. Hello, Democrats. So, President Obama had to follow Michelle. I had to follow Gabby and Pink. Gabby amazes me every single day. She was able to walk out and address you tonight because she's a fighter. And thanks to a team of doctors, nurses, and especially her speech therapist. We all need a team. I've flown into space four times. I've flown into combat nearly 40 times. Not once did I do that by myself. It took a team to accomplish a mission. It always does. I flew in the Navy during the first Gulf War. America rallied our allies to kick out a tyrant who invaded a neighbor. Today, Vladimir Putin is testing whether we're still that strong. Iran, North Korea, and especially China watch closely. What's Trump's answer? He invited Russia to do, and these are his words, not mine, whatever the hell they want. <laughs> Vice President Harris has always championed America's support for NATO, for Ukraine, and for the Ukrainian people. On the Senate Intelligence Committee, she investigated Russian interference in our election. 
She defends free and fair elections everywhere. You already know how Trump feels about those. Donald Trump skipped his intelligence briefings. He was too busy sucking up to dictators and dreaming of becoming one himself. Trump thinks that Americans who have made the ultimate sacrifice are suckers and losers. If we fall for that again and make him the commander in chief, the only suckers would be us. Kamala Harris knows that standing with our allies means standing up for Americans. She'll keep modernizing our military to support our troops and to support our veterans like our next Vice President, Tim Walls. The world laughs at Trump, literally. But folks, it is not funny. When he was president, that meant the world was laughing at us. The threats we face are too serious. The sacrifices our service members make are too sacred. The alliances we've spent decades building are too critical. That's what's at stake now. And the choice, the choice isn't even close. But in Arizona and nationwide, this election will be. We'll win in the same way we launch rockets into space and land fighter jets on an aircraft carrier as one team on one mission. State by state, voter by voter coming together. No country, no country is better than ours at solving big problems. So, on November 5th, Let's prove that America is still the leader the world needs today by the electing the leader we need right now, Kamala Harris. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Please welcome former Secretary of Defense, Leon Panetta. Former Defense Secretary, former Congressman, former Director of the CIA. My fellow Americans, I'm proud to have served in the Army, the Congress, the White House, Chief of Staff, CIA Director, and Secretary of Defense. I've looked into the eyes of our warriors and deployed them into battle. I gave the order directing our special operations forces to fly two helicopters 150 miles into Abbottabad at night. And by the time the sun rose, Osama bin Laden was dead. Because, because nobody attacks our country and gets away with it. Nobody. That's, that's what our warriors do. That's what our warriors do. Our warriors need a tough, cool-headed commander-in-chief to defend our democracy, from tyrants and terrorists, we need Kamala Harris behind the Resolute Desk. 
She knows, she knows the tyrant when she sees one. And our allies know a leader when they see one. On the Senate Intelligence Committee and as Vice President, she worked with more than 150 world leaders. She's looked our allies in the eye and said, America has your back. Trump would abandon our allies and isolate America. We tried that in the 1930s. It was foolish and dangerous then, and it's foolish and dangerous now. Listen to President Reagan. President Reagan, isolationism never was and never will be an acceptable response to tyrannical governments. Never. Trump tells tyrants like Putin they can do whatever the hell they want. Kamala Harris tells tyrants the hell you can, not on my watch. She's worked with President Zelensky to fight back against Russia. She knows that protecting their democracy protects our democracy as well. Look, Donald Trump does not understand the world. And he does not understand the service and sacrifice of our military. Our fallen veterans are not suckers. They are not losers. They are our heroes. Kamala Harris will honor our veterans. And in Tim Walz, we will have a vice president who has served in uniform honorably for 24 years. Kamala Harris understands this moment. It is a moment of danger and a moment of opportunity. She'll keep America's military the strongest in the world, the strongest ever known. And she understands what our military is for. The role of our military is to defend us from foreign enemies. It is not to threaten Americans, and it sure as hell isn't to put immigrants in camps. Every president, every president since World War II, Republican and Democrat, has shared the belief that America must protect democracy in the world. Every president has honored our veterans and their sacrifices. Every president, but one, but one. So we face a critical choice, to vote for someone who stands with our military and stands up for democracy, or someone who will disrespect our heroes and undermine our democracy. My fellow Americans, there is only one choice, one choice. And let me tell you something. When she takes her oath of office, as she will this January, our allies will cheer, our enemies will fear, and we will have a commander-in-chief that we can trust. God bless our veterans, and God bless our country. Former Defense Secretary Leon Panetta.
giving a commander-in-chief endorsement for Kamala Harris. We're going to get a, a quick break in here. And still ahead tonight, the biggest speech of the night and the entire convention, Vice President Kamala Harris is in the building about to speak. And yes, those rumors of Beyonce still flying here at the Democratic You're National not leaving, Convention go. in Chicago. <laughs> we'll be right back after this. Watching the last several uh, several remarks talking about the commander in chief role and and burnishing the credentials of Kamala Harris and now uh, veterans invited onto the stage. Amen. Veterans serving in, in the government now. Ruben Gallego of Arizona now addressing the convention hall just before the top of the hour now, almost 10 o'clock in the east and 9 o'clock here in Chicago. For the fourth and final night of the Democratic National Convention, moments and now this crowd of thousands in Chicago and millions of people watching at home will witness history. Yeah, Vice President Kamala Harris, she's in the building now. She is the star of this convention, but especially this night. She's about to officially become the first black woman and Asian American person to accept a major party nomination for president. And in addition to breaking barriers, that speech will also be historic because of the backstory. Harris taking the top of the ticket just weeks after her first running mate, President Biden, stepped aside as the Democratic nominee. All right, before that speech, we are expecting other big speeches from former Republican Congressman Adam Kinzinger, part of that outreach we've been seeing here. North Carolina Governor Roy Cooper, North Carolina suddenly in, in potential contention for the Democrats, according to them, after Kyle Perry Harris has gone to the top of the ticket, and we'll hear from the vice president's younger sister, Maya Harris. We also have Gretchen Whitmer on tap as well, the Michigan governor. Yeah, and as we gear up for the grand finale, it's unclear if we might see any surprise guests. Who are you talking at, about? At, I don't know. At a Democratic convention that's already got a lot to hold on its belief. Of course, All right. we're, we're referencing those continuing Beyonce rumors. I know. We can't help it. We just can't help ourselves. Let's bring in our senior national correspondent, Tom Yamas, who's down on the convention floor, where apparently the rumor is flying, and everybody thinks Beyonce coming, so if she's not, uh, they better come up with something. Lester brought his base. Yeah, that rumor <laughs> Yeah, that rumor continues to grow. Everyone's talking about that from sources in law enforcement to the delegates here. I also want to point out that on this last night of the convention, you know, every other night has felt like a party. There's been a lot of joy. That's a word they like to use. Tonight, there are different layers, and we have seen that over the past hour. First, with those relatives of victims of gun violence, and then now the issue of national security and patriotism. Just behind me, about to take the stage, is a very popular Democrat. Also in that short list, initially, for the running mate for Vice President Kamala Harris, which is Michigan's government. Governor Gretchen Whitmer. And let's listen as she takes the stage. I'm Governor Gretchen Whitmer. In Lansing, they call me Governor. But in Detroit, they call me Big Gretch. <laughs> Donald Trump called me that woman from Michigan an insult. <laughs> Being a woman from Michigan is a badge of honor. Like women across America, we just GSD. Get stuff done. At 29, I joined the sandwich generation. Sandwiched between working and raising my newborn and caring for my mom, who was dying from brain cancer. It was hard, but not extraordinary. It's life. Those nights reminded me who I was fighting for. People just trying to make it. Kamala Harris knows who she's fighting for, too. She took care of her mom, who also battled cancer. As president, she'll fight to lower the cost of health care and elder care for every family. She's lived a life like ours. She knows us. Donald Trump doesn't know you at all. You think he understands that when your car breaks down, you can't get to work? No. 
His first word was probably chauffeur. <laughs> you think he's ever had to take items out of the cart before checking out? Hell, you think he's ever been to a grocery store? That's what the chauffeur is for. But Kamala Harris, she gets us. She sees us. She is us. Look, we've all lived through a lot of history over the past few years. Floods and fires, an attempted coup, a plot, and a pandemic. It's exhausting. We don't know what the next four years will bring. But what we do know is this. Through it all, your life won't stop. You're going to have to get to work, pick up the kids, and pay your bills. And then one day, when you're just trying to get everyone out the door, a news alert goes off. Something happened. Something hit the fan. You'll ask, is my family going to be OK? And then you'll ask, who the hell is in charge? What if it's him? What, what if it's that man from Mara Largo? I know, in a crisis, we need someone strong enough to come up with a plan to tell the truth, and to bring people together. Right now, before the crisis, is when we get to choose. Why wouldn't we choose the leader who's tough, tested, and a total badass? as our Commander-in-Chief. America, let's choose Kamala Harris. Of Michigan, who has crossed swords with Donald Trump a time or two, taking the stage there, and as the convention hall gets set for the next speaker, let's uh, go to Kelly O'Donnell. She's got this coveted podium position, and if you are looking at the stage there. Kelly is just to the left of it and has an eagle-eyed view and can see what's going on. Kelly, what's the vibe? Well, all week long, we've been able to peer in right behind the stage and see all of the speakers who were coming up see some of the backstage interactions and just a couple of minutes ago that blue curtain came down uh, to use a democratic parlance a blue wall if you will which now blocks our ability to see what's happening backstage and then separately I've been getting lots of signals from people who are saying that there is a very special surprise guest and we want to be very careful about not going too far at the same time, uh, I also want to tell you about President Biden making a phone call. He and the First Lady have placed a phone call from Santa Inez, California, where they are on vacation, to the Vice President and have wished her encouragement for tonight and to say that they are going to be watching tonight. And so they posted that photo on social media. So there are a lot of tantalizing tidbits about what could be happening backstage tonight. Uh, we have had sources that have told us it is Beyonce. We have had sources that have said it is not. It is one of the biggest rumors of the evening. Uh, and of course, the song Freedom is one of the issues uh, that has been a playlist already. Whether a DJ is spinning it or people are doing the lyrics, that of course is Beyonce's song. And one of the big questions is, will she be here tonight? So there are a lot of things we know. I don't want to go too far beyond uh, what our editorial standards allow. But the blue curtain is one heck of a clue. Walked Savannah, us to the Lester? You walked us to the edge. <laughs> 
good. <laughs> the blue curtain, the blue wall. We're right at the edge of just lunacy. I, I gotta say, Lester, if it's not Beyonce, I hope it's they're gonna they deliver Taylor Swift somebody. or something. <laughs> they better come up with <laughs> someone because the anticipation in this room and, and this, <laughs> this this rumor has persisted. All the people have been stopping me. I'm like, I know something. I know. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting actually because they've tried to do these surprises, but last night's bring Holly and, and Kristen in here. Last night, um, Oprah was supposed to be a surprise, but that the cat got out of that bag uh, pretty fast, and so people knew, and so some were probably surprised, but not everyone. Yeah, regardless, it was unexpected. She was not on that list that comes out days in advance of who's set to speak. It was meant to be a moment to build some anticipation mm -hmm. and to get people excited, because remember, that is what this convention is all about. Yes, to a degree, it's about policy and all of these things. It is a party. It is a time for the Democrats to reset. Again, and show your word. best face. I mean, let's face it, that's what conventions are about. Yeah, they want to show off. They want to show off. They want to bring that momentum in to keep that so-called honeymoon going here. I mean, listen, not to do a, a hacky TV transition, but you talk about that blue curtain there. There's also, of course, the blue wall, those Rust Belt battlegrounds. That's why you heard from Gretchen Whitmer. And when you look at the momentum that is building around Kamala Harris, Democrats will point to Michigan as a place where she is now doing slightly better than former President Trump. Charlie, I love President you Biden. for trying to bring us back to our sanity here <laughs> and bringing us back to the political nerd lane that we need to stay in. But on the subject of Beyonce, serious question, Chris. Yes. I mean, the Democrats have always had a ton of celebrities yes. come out here. They can right. always trot them out. I mean, that's right. just part of it. Does that translate to votes? I mean, if they do an event with a Beyonce or a Taylor Swift sometime down the road, is that going to get people to actually come to the polls? It, it could energize young voters. Again, these all-important young voters we're talking about. But the timing's important. Let's go back to 2016 and Beyonce, who did a big event for Hillary Clinton right before Election Day. It did not translate into all the right. type of win she We made. are going to hear now from former Illinois Republican in Congressman Adam Kinzinger. Kinzinger describes himself as a proud conservative, but tonight he is throwing his support behind Vice President Harris. We in the trenches with you as part of this sometimes awkward alliance that we have to defend truth, defend democracy, and decency. I was just a kid when I was drawn to the party of Ronald Reagan to his vision of a strong America, the shining city on a hill. I was a Republican for 12 years in Congress, and I still hold on to the label. I never thought I'd be here, but listen, you never thought you'd see me here, did you? <laughs> but <laughs> I've learned something about the Democratic Party, and I want to let my fellow Republicans in on the secret. The Democrats are as patriotic as us. just as much as we do. And they... And they are as eager to defend American values at home and abroad as we conservatives have ever been. I was relieved to discover that because I've learned something about my party, too, something I couldn't ignore. The Republican Party is no longer conservative. It has switched its allegiance from the principles that gave it purpose to a man whose only purpose is himself. <laughs> Donald Trump is a weak man pretending to be strong. small man pretending to be big. He's a faithless man pretending to be righteous. He's a perpetrator who can't stop playing the victim. He puts on, listen, he, he, he puts on quite a show, but there is no real strength there. As a conservative and a veteran, I believe true strength lies in defending the vulnerable. It's in protecting your family. It's in standing up for our Constitution and our democracy. That, that is the soul of being a conservative. It used to be the soul of being a Republican. But Donald Trump has suffocated the soul of the Republican Party. 
His fundamental weakness has coursed through my party like an illness, sapping our strength, softening our spine, whipping us into a fever that has untethered us from our values. Our democracy was frayed by the events of January 6th, as Donald Trump's deceit and dishonor led to a siege on the United States Capitol. That day, I stood witness to a profound sorrow, the desecration of our sacred tradition of peaceful transition of power, tarnished by a man too fragile, too vain, and too weak to accept defeat. How can a party claim to be patriotic if it idolizes a man who tried to overthrow a free and fair election? claim to stand for liberty if it sees a fight for freedom in Ukraine, an attack pitting tyranny against democracy, a challenge to everything our nation claims to be. And it retreats. It equivocates. It nominates a man who is weirdly obsessed with Putin. And his running mate, his running mate who said, quote, I don't care what happens in Ukraine. Yeah, and he wants to be vice president. Yeah. How can a party claim to be conservative when it tarnishes the gifts that our forebears fought for? Men like my grandfather, who served in World War II, who believed in a cause bigger than himself, and he risked his life for it behind enemy lines. To preserve American democracy, his generation found the courage to face down armies. Listen, all we're asked to do is to summon the courage to stand up to one weak man. Some, some, have questioned, some have questioned why I've taken the stand I have. The answer is really simple, ladies and gentlemen. We must put country first. And tonight, and tonight, as a Republican speaking before you, I'm putting our country first. Because the fact is, I do belong here. I know Kamala Harris shares my allegiance to the rule of law, the Constitution, and democracy. And she is dedicated to upholding all three in service to our country. Whatever policies we disagree on pale in comparison with those fundamental matters of principle, of decency, and of fidelity to this nation. Listen, to my fellow Republicans, if you still pledge allegiance to those principles, I suspect you belong here too. Because Because democracy knows no party. It's a, it's a living, breathing ideal that defines us as a nation. It's the bedrock that separates us from tyranny. And when that foundation is fractured, we must all stand together, united, to strengthen it. If you think those principles are worth defending, then I urge you, make the right choice. Vote, vote for our bedrock values and vote for Kamala Harris. God bless you. A longtime conservative Republican getting the welcome mat here at the Democratic National Convention, saying his party has essentially rejected. In fact, he said the Republican Party is no longer conservative, a stinging indictment of the party under Trump. Kinzinger, by the way, a member of the January 6th committee that investigated the actions of that day and paid a price politically, no longer a sitting congressman. This is Vice President Harris's younger sister, Maya. In 1958, a 19-year-old from India left the only country she'd ever known to chart her own path in America. She came here to pursue an education, but she stayed here to build a life. Her name was Dr. Shamala Gopalan Harris. But we 
Nobody called her mommy. Mommy was so many things to so many people. A civil rights activist, a scientist, a devoted mother to her two little girls. But most of all, Mommy was a trailblazer who defied the odds and defined herself. And when it came to Kamala and me, Mommy had great expectations for us, but she had even greater expectations of us. She, she raised us to believe that we could be and do anything. And we believed her. You see, Mommy understood the power and the possibility that come with knowing and showing who you truly are. She, she knew we could be the authors of our own stories, just as she'd been the author of her own. Mommy's journey and the opportunity that she wanted for Kamala and me, that's a distinctly American story. We may all have different histories, different struggles, or different perspectives, but what binds us together is the fervent desire to be free, to fulfill our God-given potential. Kamala's entire life has been about fighting for each of us to have that freedom. And like so many Americans, Kamala knows what it's like to be underestimated and be counted out. She knows what it's like to be the underdog and yet still beat the odds. And now she has created so much electricity, so much optimism, so much joy throughout the nation, and it is why we need her leadership in this historic moment. We are living in a time when some are trying to divide us, to separate us in ways that make it difficult for us to come together. Well, look, my sister rejects that view. Where others push darkness, Kamala sees promise. Where others feel detachment, Kamala fosters connection. Where others want to drag us back to the past. My sister says, hold up now. We are not going back. Because Kamala understands we have so much more in common than what separates us. She knows the measure of our success isn't just winning an election. It's about who we bring along and lift up in the process. And so as I look out at all of you today and take in this incredible moment, I so wish that Mommy could be here tonight I can just see her smiling, saying how proud she is of Kamala. And then, without missing a beat, she say, that's enough, you got work to do. She would tell all of us to roll up our sleeves and get to work to elect a leader who sees the potential in each of us, a leader who cares for all of us, a leader who fights for every one of us. Our Democratic nominee, my big sister, the next president of the United States, Kamala Harris. the Vice President's sister with a ringing endorsement. Younger Jesus sister and only North sibling. North Carolina Governor Roy Cooper. North Carolina Governor Cooper, now, 
Uh, Kamala Harris. He's a close political ally with Vice President Harris, once battered as a potential running mate before he took himself out of contention. They met when they were both state's attorney general. I'm going to the last guy standing between you and the moment we're all waiting for. So, so I'm going to get right to it. All week, you've heard stories about my friend Kamala. I want to take you behind the scenes of one of them. 2011 was a rough time for American homeowners. Hundreds of thousands were losing their homes to illegal foreclosure. I was attorney general in North Carolina, while Kamala had just become California's. All the AGs were close to a settlement with the big banks, and it was a pretty good deal. Would have meant $4 billion for California families who'd been ripped off. I know that sounds like a lot, but Kamala said, hang on a minute. I've met these families. I know what they've been through, and they deserve more. She went toe-to-toe -to -toe with some of the world's most powerful executives, and she refused to give in. Let me tell you, this was a huge risk, but she knew it was a risk worth taking. That's Kamala. And we all know what happened. The banks caved. That $4 billion for California families became $20 billion. That was the first time I witnessed Kamala in action. And what I saw was a leader who does exactly what she says she's going to do, who never will settle for less. America, we got a lot of big fights ahead of us, and we've got one hell of a fighter ready to take them on. I know that. I know that because I know her. And tonight, I want the American people to know, if any, even if you don't agree with her on everything, Kamala Harris will fight for you to the very end. For families who need better health care or a safer place to live, Kamala will fight for you. For parents who want better schools for their kids, for workers worried about a secure retirement for themselves, Kamala will fight for you. For any one of our allies anywhere in the world wondering if America still has your back, remember this. Kamala will fight for you. And when she fights, we win. Kamala's ready. Kamala's ready. The question is, are we? Are we going to stand up and fight for Kamala like she'll stand up and fight for us? All right. If you're ready, my home state of North Carolina, stand up. Stand up, Pennsylvania. Stand up, Michigan. Stand up, Wisconsin. Stand up, Georgia. Stand up, Nevada. Stand up, Arizona. Stand up, America. Governor Roy Cooper with a rallying cry for this convention hall that is about as fired up as it can, can get, and yet uh, we are now entering a portion of the programming that gets us ready for the speech from Kamala Harris, a biographical video. Let's watch. When your first grade teacher would show up at your law school graduation. It's where Kamala Harris learned what it means to be in the middle class, making every paycheck count. She was raised by a working mom who taught her about standing up for what's right and protecting the people you love. 
Kamala carries the lessons of our mother, the fighting spirit of our mother, the compassion. She was all of five feet tall. If you met her, you would have thought she was seven feet tall. And our mother, if I'd ever come home complaining about anything, she wouldn't have it. The first thing she'd say is, well, just stop the complaining. Just tell me what you're going to do about it. And since she was a young girl, Kamala Harris has been fighting for families like the ones she grew up with. That is Kamala. She can't help herself from standing up for people and standing up for what she thinks is right. She has been that way our whole lives. Being a protector is what led her to become a prosecutor. Looking back now, I could say it was her calling. As a courtroom prosecutor, she went after predators who targeted women and children and fraudsters who ripped off working families. And she put dangerous gang members and human traffickers behind bars. We didn't have partnerships with DOJ or FBI or DEA or any of those law enforcement agencies. Now, we all work collaboratively. She was the person who built the foundation in how we do criminal justice in America. As Attorney General of California, she held the big Wall Street banks accountable for fraud, winning $20 billion for California families. She took on one of the largest for-profit colleges that was scamming students. And in the Senate, she fought for her constituents with the determination of the prosecutor, standing up for reproductive freedom. Can you think of any laws that give the government the power to make decisions about the male body? I'm not, a, I'm not a thinking of any right now, Senator. She fought to keep our children safe from the terror of gun violence. How many of you guys had to have a drill where you learned about how you need to hide in a closet or crouch in a corner in the event that there was a mass shooter? Look at that. Look at that. On the Intelligence Committee, she defended our nation against foreign adversaries. And in 2020, she made history as the first woman to be elected vice president of the United States. She cast the tie-breaking vote to deliver urgent relief to the American people during the pandemic. She beat Big Pharma to lower prescription drug costs and capped the cost of insulin. And led the fight to restore reproductive rights after Roe v. Wade was overturned. We have worked too hard and fought too long to see our daughters grow up in a world with fewer rights than our mothers. Because she's never been afraid to stand up to powerful interests. Sometimes people will open the door for you and leave it open. Sometimes they won't. And then you need to kick that door down. <laughs> Excuse my language. <laughs> now she's running for president, still fighting for families like the one she grew up with. Our campaign is about saying we trust the people. We're saying we just want fairness. We want dignity. And we are a work in progress. We haven't yet quite reached all of those ideals, but we will die trying because we love our country. We believe in our country. We're not falling for these folks who are trying to divide us, trying to pull us apart. We know what we stand for, and we stand for the people, and we stand for the dignity of work, and we stand for freedom. We stand for justice. We stand for equality. And so we that's who Kamala Harris is. That's what she believes. And that's what she'll fight for every day. Please welcome the Democratic nominee for president, Vice President of the United States of America, Kamala Harris.
Once today we heard the word joy several times during this convention, and we are now witnessing joy of these delegates who have waited for this moment to think that a month ago no one knew what it would look like at the Democratic convention. But this is the unity and, yes, the joy that they have pieced together in short order as we are about to hear from Kamala Harris. incredible husband, Doug, for being an incredible partner to me, an incredible father to Cole and Ella, and happy anniversary, Dougie. <laughs> I love you so very much. To our President, Joe Biden. travel together, Joe, I am filled with gratitude. Your record is extraordinary, as history will show, and your character is inspiring. And Doug and I love you and Jill and are forever thankful to you both. Your support is humbling. So, America, the path that led me here in recent weeks was no doubt unexpected. But I'm no stranger to unlikely journeys. So, my mother, our mother, Shamala Harris, had one of her own. And I miss her every day, and especially right now. And I know she's looking down smiling. was 19 when she crossed the world alone, traveling from India to California with an unshakable dream to be the scientist who would cure breast cancer. When she finished school, she was supposed to return home to a traditional arranged marriage. But as fate would have it, she met my father, Donald Harris, a student from Jamaica, and that act of self-determination made my sister Maya and me. Yeah. 
Growing up, we moved a lot. I will always remember that big Mayflower truck packed with all our belongings, ready to go to Illinois, to Wisconsin, <laughs> and wherever our parents' jobs took us. My early memories of our parents together are very joyful ones. A home filled with laughter and music, Aretha, Coltrane, and Miles. At the park, my mother would say, stay close. But my father would say, as he smiled, run, Kamala, run, don't be afraid, don't let anything stop you. From my earliest years, he taught me to be fearless. But the harmony between my parents did not last. When I was in elementary school, they split up. And it was mostly my mother who raised us. Before she could finally afford to buy a home, she rented a small apartment in the East Bay. In the Bay, in the Bay, you either live in the hills or the flatlands. We lived in the flats. A beautiful working class neighborhood of firefighters, nurses, and construction workers. Who tended their lawns with pride. My mother, she worked long hours, and like many working parents, she leaned on a trusted circle to help raise us. Mrs. Shelton, who ran the daycare below us and became a second mother. Uncle Sherman, Aunt Mary, Uncle Freddie, Auntie Chris, none of them family by blood, and all of them family by love. <laughs> family who taught us how to make gumbo, how to play chess, and sometimes even let us win. Family who loved us, believed in us, and told us we could be anything and do anything. instilled in us the values they personified, community, faith, and the importance of treating others as you would want to be treated, with kindness, respect, and compassion. My mother was a brilliant, five-foot-tall brown woman with an accent. And as the eldest child, as the eldest child, I saw how the world would sometimes treat her. But my mother never lost her cool. She was tough, courageous, a trailblazer in the fight for women's health, and she taught Maya and me a lesson that Michelle mentioned the other night. She taught us to never complain about injustice, but do something about it. Do She always, she also taught us, and she also taught us, and never do anything half-assed. <laughs> and that is a direct quote. <laughs> a direct quote. I grew up immersed in the ideals of the civil rights movement. My parents had met at a civil rights gathering, and they made sure that we learned about civil rights leaders, including the lawyers like Thurgood Marshall and Con Constance Baker Motley, those who battled in the courtroom to make real the promise of America. So at a young age, I decided I wanted to do that work. I wanted to be a lawyer. And when it came time to choose the type of law I would pursue, I reflected on a pivotal moment in my life. You see, when I was in high school, I started to notice something about my best friend, Wanda. She was sad at school, and there were times she didn't want to go home. So one day I asked if everything was all right. 
and she confided in me that she was being sexually abused by her stepfather. And I immediately told her she had to come stay with us, and she did. This is one of the reasons I became a prosecutor, to protect people like Wanda, because I believe everyone has a right to safety, to dignity, and to justice. When I had a case, I charged it not in the name of the victim, but in the name of the people. For a simple reason, in our system of justice, a harm against any one of us is a harm against all of us. this to console survivors of crime, to remind them no one should be made to fight alone. We are all in this together. And every day in the courtroom, I stood proudly before a judge and I said five words, Kamala Harris for the people. To be clear, and to be clear, my entire career, I've only had one client, the people. And so, on behalf of the people, on behalf of every American, regardless of party, race, gender, or the language your grandmother speaks, on behalf of my mother and everyone who has ever set out on their own unlikely journey, on behalf of Americans like the people I grew up with, people who work hard, chase their dreams, and look out for one another, on behalf of everyone whose story could only be written in the greatest nation on earth. I accept your nomination to be President of the United States of America. And with this election, election has a precious, fleeting opportunity to move past the bitterness, cynicism, and divisive battles of the past, a chance to chart a new way forward. Not, not as members of any one party or faction, but as Americans. And let me say, I know there are people of various political views watching tonight, and I want you to know, I promise to be a president for all Americans. You can always trust me to put country above party and self, to hold sacred America's fundamental principles from the rule of law to free and fair elections, to the peaceful transfer of power. I will be a president who unites us around our highest aspirations, a president who leads and listens, who is realistic, practical, and has common sense and always fights for the American people. From the courthouse to the White House, that has been my life's work. As a young 
courtroom prosecutor in Oakland, California. I stood up for women and children against predators who abuse them. As Attorney General of California, I took on the big banks, delivered $20 billion for middle-class families who faced foreclosure, and helped pass a homeowner bill of rights, one of the first of its kind in the nation. I stood up for veterans and students being scammed by big for-profit colleges who are being cheated out of their wages, the wages they were due, for seniors facing elder abuse. I fought against the cartels who traffic in guns and drugs and human beings, who threaten the security of our border and the safety of our communities. And I will tell you, these fights were not easy. And neither were the elections that put me in those offices. We were underestimated at practically every turn. But we never gave up, because the future is always worth fighting for. This election is not only the most important of our lives, it is one of the most important in the life of our nation. In many ways, Donald Trump is an unserious man. But the consequences, but the consequences of putting Donald Trump back in the White House are extremely serious. <laughs> consider, consider not only the chaos and calamity when he was in office, but also the gravity of what has happened since he lost the last election. <laughs> Donald Trump tried to throw away your votes when he failed he sent an armed mob to the United States Capitol where they assaulted law enforcement officers. When politicians in his own party begged him to call off the mob and send help, he did the opposite. He fanned the flames. And now, for an entirely different set of crimes, he was found guilty of fraud by a jury of everyday Americans and separately, and separately found liable for committing sexual abuse. And consider, consider what he intends to do if we give him power again. Consider his explicit intent to set free violent extremists who assaulted those law enforcement officers at the Capitol. His explicit intent to jail journalists, political opponents, and anyone he sees as the enemy. His explicit intent to deploy our active duty military against our own citizens. Consider, consider the power he will have, especially after the United States Supreme Court just ruled that he would be immune from criminal prosecution. Just imagine Donald Trump with no guardrails and how he would use the immense powers of the presidency of the United States, not to improve your life, not to strengthen our national security, but to serve the only client he has ever had, himself. And we 
we know what a second Trump term would look like. It's all laid out in Project 2025, written by his closest advisors, and its sum total is to pull our country back to the past. But America, we are not going back. Affordable Care Act, when insurance companies could deny people with pre-existing conditions. We are not going to let him eliminate the Department of Education that funds our public schools. We are not going to let him end programs like Head Start that provide preschool and childcare for our children. America, we are not going back. forward, forward to a future with a strong and growing middle class, because we know a strong middle class has always been critical to America's success. And building that middle class will be a defining goal of my presidency. And I'll tell you, this is personal for me. The middle class is where I come from. My mother kept a strict budget. We lived within our means, yet we wanted for little. And she expected us to make the most of the opportunities that were available to us and to be grateful for them. Because as she taught us, opportunity is not available to everyone. That's why we will create what I call an opportunity economy, an opportunity economy where everyone has the chance to compete and a chance to succeed. Whether you live in a rural area, small town, or big city, and as president, I will bring together labor and workers and small and to lower the cost of everyday needs like health care and housing and groceries. We will provide access to capital for small business owners and entrepreneurs and founders. And we will end America's housing shortage and protect Social Security and Medicare. Now compare that to Donald Trump, because I think everyone here knows he doesn't actually fight for the middle class. Not He doesn't actually fight for the middle class. Instead, he fights for himself and his billionaire friends. And he will give them another round of tax breaks that will add up to $5 trillion to the national debt. And all the while, he intends to enact what, in effect, is a national sales tax, call it a Trump tax, that would raise prices on middle-class families by almost $4,000 a year. Well, instead of a Trump tax hike, we will pass a middle-class tax cut that will benefit more than 100 million Americans. I believe America cannot truly be prosperous unless Americans are fully able to make their own decisions about their own lives, especially on matters of heart and home. But tonight, in America, too many women are not able to make those decisions. And let's be clear about how we got here. 
Donald Trump handpicked members of the United States Supreme Court to take away reproductive freedom. And now he brags about it. In his words, quote, I did it and I'm proud to have done it, end quote. Well, I'll tell you, over the past two years, I've traveled across our country and women have told me their stories. Husbands and fathers have shared theirs. Stories of women miscarrying in a parking lot, developing sepsis, losing the ability to ever again have children, all because doctors are afraid they may go to jail for caring for their patients. Couples just trying to grow their family, cut off in the middle of IVF treatments. Children who have survived sexual assault, potentially being forced to carry a pregnancy to term. This is what's happening in our country because of Donald Trump. And understand, he is not done. As a part of his agenda, he and his allies would limit access to birth control, ban medication abortion, and enact a nationwide abortion ban with or without Congress. And get this, get this, he plans to create a national anti-abortion coordinator and force states to report on women's miscarriages and abortions. Simply put, they are out of their minds. And one must ask, one must ask, why exactly is it that they don't trust women? Well, we trust women. We trust women. And when Congress passes a bill to restore reproductive freedom, as President of the United States, I will proudly sign it into law. Many other fundamental freedoms are at stake. The freedom to live safe from gun violence in our schools, communities, and places of worship. The freedom to love who you love openly and with pride. The freedom to breathe clean air and drink clean water and live free from the pollution that fuels the climate crisis the freedom that unlocks all the others, the freedom to vote. With this election, we finally have the opportunity to pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Act and the Freedom to Vote Act. And let me be clear, and let me be clear. After decades in law enforcement, I know the importance of safety and security, especially at our border. Last year, Joe and I brought together Democrats and conservative Republicans to write the strongest border bill in decades. The Border Patrol endorsed it. But Donald Trump believes a border deal would hurt his campaign. So he ordered his allies in Congress to kill the deal. Well, I refuse to play politics with our security. And here is my pledge to you. As president, I will bring back the bipartisan border security bill that he killed, and I will sign it into law. I know, I know we can live up to our proud heritage as a nation of immigrants and reform our broken immigration system. We can create an earned pathway to citizenship and secure our border.
and America, we must also be steadfast in advancing our security and values abroad. As Vice President, I have confronted threats to our security, negotiated with foreign leaders, strengthened our alliances, and engaged with our brave troops overseas. As Commander-in-Chief, I will ensure America always has the strongest, most lethal fighting force in the world. And I will fulfill our sacred obligation to care for our troops and their families, and I will always honor and never disparage their service and their sacrifice. and artificial intelligence that America, not China, wins the competition for the 21st century and that we strengthen, not abdicate, our global leadership. Trump, on the other hand, threatened to abandon NATO. He encouraged Putin to invade our allies, said Russia could, quote, do whatever the hell they want. Five days before Russia attacked Ukraine, I met with President Zelensky to warn him about Russia's plan to invade. I helped mobilize a global response over 50 countries to defend against Putin's aggression. And as President, I will stand strong with Ukraine and our NATO allies. to the war in Gaza, President Biden and I are working around the clock because now is the time to get a hostage deal and a ceasefire deal done. And let me be clear, and let me be clear, I will always stand up for Israel's right to defend itself sure Israel has the ability to defend itself because the people of Israel must never again face the horror that a terrorist organization called Hamas caused on October 7, including unspeakable sexual violence and the massacre of young people at a music festival. At the same time, what has happened in Gaza over the past 10 months is devastating. So many innocent lives lost. Desperate, hungry people fleeing for safety over and over again. The scale of suffering is heartbreaking. President Biden and I are working to end this war such that Israel is secure, the hostages are released, the suffering in Gaza ends, and the Palestinian people can realize their right to dignity, security, freedom, and self-determination. And know this, I will never hesitate to take to defend our forces and our interests against Iran and Iran-backed terrorists. I will not cozy up to tyrants and dictators like Kim Jong-un who are rooting for Trump. Who are rooting for Trump. Because, you know, they know, they know he is easy to manipulate with flattery and favors. They know Trump won't hold autocrats accountable because he wants to be an autocrat himself. And as president, 
I will never waver in defense of America's security and ideals because in the enduring struggle between democracy and tyranny, I know where I stand and I know where the United States belongs. country with all my heart. Everywhere I go, everywhere I go, in everyone I meet, I see a nation that is ready to move forward, ready for the next step in the incredible journey that is America. I see an America where we hold fast to the fearless belief that built our nation and inspired the world. That here, in this country, anything is possible. That nothing is out of reach. An America where we care for one another, look out for one another and recognize that we have so much more in common than what separates us. That none of us, none of us has to fail for all of us to succeed. And that in unity there is strength. You know, our opponents in this race are out there every day denigrating America, talking about how terrible everything is. Well, my mother had another lesson she used to teach. Never let anyone tell you who you are. You show them who you are. Let us show each other and the world who we are and what we stand for. Freedom, opportunity, compassion, dignity, fairness, and endless possibilities. We are the heirs to the greatest democracy in the history of the world. And on behalf of our children and our grandchildren and all those who sacrificed so dearly for our freedom and liberty, we must be worthy of this moment. It is now our turn to do what generations before us have done, guided by optimism and faith to fight for this country we love, to fight for the ideals we cherish, and to uphold the awesome responsibility that comes with the greatest privilege on earth, the privilege and pride of being an American.
the Vice President of the United States, joined by her husband on stage as she makes history here in Chicago at the Democratic National Convention, formally accepting the nomination for President of the United States. And if the crowd wants Beyonce, they're at least hearing it right now as Tim Walls and his wife Gwen join the stage. Well, wherever Beyonce was watching, this is truly Kamala Harris's night on that stage tonight. And she really drew clear and sharp distinctions between herself and her opponent. Kind of a virtual confetti falling around them. The shot. Let's go down to Tom Gomez, who's on the floor of the convention and about to be hit with 100,000 balloons from the Raptors. Hey, Tom, if you can hear me, tell us what you're seeing. Hey, Savannah, how are you? Yeah, it is incredibly loud, as you can imagine. I was just looking up because it just started to happen. If I can get your guy to go up. The balloons are starting to fall. There is 100,000 of them falling right now at the United Center here in Chicago. I also want to let you know and to point out these, there are large American flags right here. The Democrats tonight sending a very clear message that no party has the monopoly on patriotism. They want to make sure Americans across the country know that Democrats as well are patriotic as these balloons fall. I spoke to some delegates here asking them about what they loved about the speech. Most of them said that the loudest cheers for them came when they were talking about Kamala Harris as a commander-in-chief, what she would do in Israel, what she would do in Ukraine. For them, that was the part they were cheering the most, and also about her life story, that her mother was the hero of her story. She was the leader in her family, that they were immigrants. They came here. Life was hard. They were not rich, and yet they figured it out and were able to have a good life, a life that she wants to give other Americans. And also, that they know who America is, and no one's going to tell them who America is, that she's going to lead America into the future. Clearly, the speech was well received as people, family, and friends are now gathering up on the stage with Kamala Harris and the second gentleman, Doug Emhoff, Governor Walls, and his family, of course, his son, Gus, the surprise star from this convention after that moment yesterday, and Democrats all across the United Center celebrating right now the official ticket, Kamala Harris, Tim Walls, ready to take on the Republican ticket, and there's about 75 days left before Election Day. Savannah Lester, I'm going to send it back to you. Balloons still falling in various sizes on the crowd here. People still soaking up the moment. Vice President Harris and her family somewhere beyond these balloons. Peter Alexander, uh, tell us exactly where you are in all this and uh, the things that stood out to you over the last half hour. Honestly, if you've, Lester, if you've ever been to a bounce house, this is that time by like 10,000 right now. These balloons are enormous. And this moment, these folks have been waiting a long time for among them. My new friend Cheryl from Chicago, Cheryl, when Kamala Harris accepted the Democratic Party's nomination, the first woman of color to do so, you were in tears, wiping them away from your eyes. What moved you so much? I come from the middle class. My parents were from the middle class. My mom was a nurse, my dad worked at the post office, and I got to go to college. But my great-great-grandparents were slaves, and my daughter is in Congress. This is so overwhelming. I never thought I'd see this. You told me you never thought you'd see a moment like this. Say that? How could you imagine it? No, this is a heck of a moment. You're right. Hey, let me. So fast. I don't think we're going anywhere for a while. There are balloons all around us, so you better get. We, we better get comfortable for a bit. Right hey, John, let me ask you. You're you're from West Hollywood, California. Yes, I'm the mayor. You stood off at least three dozen times throughout this speech. What was it that resonated with you and made this night so unique? It was hope. It's so great to believe in a candidate and someone that just wants to make the lives of American people better. And as a gay man from a, the first place of the Republican Party in Ripon, Wisconsin, to have someone up there that represents me as the president is just the best feeling in the world. John, very nice to meet you. I appreciate you. Savannah Lester, balloons, a little Beyonce, and the Democrats hope a political bounce toward November. Red, white, blue, and Beyonce.
Beyonce, let's go to Kelly O'Donnell near the podium. Off the stage, also taking incoming from the balloon. Hey, Kelly. Well, we just saw Governor Tim Walz coming over here to wave close up to Nebraska, the state of his birth, and giving the high five and touching his heart as if to say thank you and hello to those people who share a common home state. And of course, from this angle, you get a real sense of how all of the extended family is now soaking up the moment of the famous balloon drop. It's a once in a lifetime experience for them, certainly. And we know there are 100,000 of these balloons, took days to put them together, high above the rafters. And when the queue came, they started floating down. What a night for the Democrats. What an impossibly hard to predict set of events, including whether there would be guests or special guests tonight. What really uh, was the focus of this night is the kind of change that Democrats have had in changing their ticket, now defining their candidate, their running mate, and now trying to take this from Chicago to battleground states and key places around the country. So this is the party. Uh, they're inflated with balloons, with confetti, and a night of a soundtrack about freedom. So as we wait for the last of the balloons to drift down, the stage is still full with the family and extended family. We saw Doug Emhoff's parents. We saw his first wife. We saw the grandnieces of uh, the vice president, who is now, of course, the nominee, and extended family members of a blended family that represents different cultures, different backgrounds, all together standing for the Walls, Harris families who now head on the road. Back to you up in the booth. All right, let's bring back Hallie Jackson and Kristen Walker to talk about a little of this. I saw you all scribbling feverishly when we got into immigration, certainly when we got into Israel and Gaza. These are two areas that potentially can dog her during this campaign. Absolutely. Look, she took these issues on uh, head on. What was notable, Lester and Savannah, when she talked about her vision for the future, it sounds a lot like she plans to build on the Biden agenda. What this speech did was really fill in a lot of those blanks about her biography, growing up, being raised largely by her mom, painting a picture, again, that theme of a strong mother and the figurehead that she had at the head of her table who inspired her to become the person who she is, what inspired her to become a prosecutor, all of those details getting filled in. And then when she talked about what she plans to do for the country, talked about things like cutting taxes for the middle class, talked about things like uh, voting rights, things that really matter to Democrats. But again, we didn't hear a whole lot about how she would be different from a Biden administration. It's interesting because let's not forget this is someone vying to be the first female president and the aura and the feel that people get from her is important and it seems like she took on that role as prosecutor whether it's about domestic policy or standing up to America's adversaries or frankly calling out Donald Trump her opponent again and again Hallie a prosecutor who's making her own case now for why she should be the one to lead the country and while her candidacy is historic a presidency if she wins would be historic she downplays We'll that. follow up that more in a moment. We need to take a quick break. Still ahead as the Democratic convention wraps up. We're already 75 days out from Election Day. Steve Kornacki will be here to break down the state of the race in the big board after this. Welcome back to Chicago and our special coverage of the final night of the Democratic National Convention. Vice President Harris has officially accepted the Democratic nomination for president and the balloons have dropped. So there's only one thing to do and that's to check in with Steve Kornacki, our numbers guy, who can give us a sense of the state of the race now with 75 days to go, Steve, until Election Day. Yes, yeah, Savannah, a close race, but one that's changed in the last month, and you see that right here. When Joe Biden dropped out of the race, this is the average of the polls. Donald Trump was ahead by three points. In a month or so since Harris replaced Biden, you can see Harris, on average, now ahead of Trump by two points. So big picture, that has been the shift. What has powered this shift for Kamala Harris? Three groups stand out here where she has gained the most from where Joe Biden was. Black voters, she's up eight points from where Biden was. Hispanic voters. 
10-point gain for Harris. Young voters, those under 30, an 11-point gain for Harris over Biden. So that's what's happening in terms of her coalition. What does that mean for the all-important road to 270 here? So this has been the battleground map this year, and here has how that has changed with the progress Harris has made with those groups. Before Harris got in the race, the Democratic path under Biden was very narrow. It meant win Wisconsin, win Michigan, win Pennsylvania. Those were their three best and maybe only realistic targets by the time that Biden had dropped out. You can see what a win there for the Democrats would do in those three states. They'd be at exactly 270, nothing to spare at all. But it's now changing because of those demographic changes I showed you. More support from Hispanic voters, Nevada, Arizona potentially coming into play here. More support from black voters, Georgia, and how about this one? North Carolina, a red state in 2016 and 20. Democrats have said they want to make this a battleground. There's polling now in North Carolina showing a dead even race, even maybe Harris ahead by a point or two. And so what that means is Harris no longer has that Biden limitation of having to win those three states there in the Midwest, in the Great Lakes area. Potentially, at least, she could win in some of these Sun Belt states and take the pressure off of that Great Lakes path. More paths, more possibilities for Democrats. We'll see if they can capitalize them in these next two months. It looks like she's expanded the possibilities on that, Matt. Steve, thank you so much. We're going to take another break right here. And coming up, our final thoughts, the big takeaways from tonight's finale here at the DNC with Vice President Harris making history. We're back right after this. terms of momentum and, and what some people call the sugar high coming out of here. Democrats hope they keep it up. They hope they have it. They hope they continue it for the next 75 days because that's going to be critical to turning out the Democratic base, which they need to do, and also to convince independent and maybe some moderate Republican voters to get behind Kamala Harris. That was one of the themes repeatedly tonight, and you heard Kamala Harris deliver that message directly into the camera, speaking to Americans, saying, I will represent all of you. Of course, from here on out, it is going to be a fight. This race, as Steve just out is extremely competitive, and the next high-profile primetime moment will not be a party. It'll be a face-off event. Yeah, and and I heard that Beyonce is going to be at that debate. <laughs> no, just, we'll, all be, I, we'll all be sitting around the, the table covering act. a debate here for yeah. long. <laughs> well, it uh, be long. Debates are the next shoe to drop. That's the next big test. We know that Vice President Harris has already started to prepare for the debate, and I'll be curious to see if between now and then she starts to put some more meat on the bones of these policy proposals. We heard her talk about today as she, as Hallie just said, tries to reach out to those independent and moderate voters. And if at any point she does start to lean more into the historic nature of her campaign, clearly she's going to emphasize the strong female figures. All right. Well, that is going to conclude our coverage of this year's Democratic National Convention. We'll, we'll have, have much more ahead on NBC News Now and a full wrap-up on tomorrow, tomorrow on Today. I'm Lester Holt. And I'm Savannah Guthrie. So glad to have you with us this week. Good night, and we'll see you bright and early for today. Good night, Good night everybody. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.